Yeah. So what does this mean? This means that if I want to uh, solve this minimization, it's really easy. Every time that I'm stuck choosing one of the y's, I just divide by the sigma. And otherwise, I might as well take y, uh, yi, I guess these aren't vectors actually. Um, I might as well take yi equals zero, right? Because I'm trying to minimize the normal y. Why put extra stuff in there? Yeah? This is tricky. So, I can define sigma plus to the matrix of 1 over the sigma if it's non zero, and just zero otherwise. Yeah? And what I just showed you is this relationship here that y is equal to sigma plus d. Hopefully you believe me that that uh, optimizes this energy here, or this, this optimization problem. And in particular, then, if we go back, right, we go, we put all of our substitutions back in, this tells us that x is equal to v sigma plus u transpose v. Remember that, 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 that this u uh, sigma v transpose came from uh, factoring a. Yeah? Oh, so we got all the way into the trenches, we came out with a nice formula. Right? And notice that this formula is really slick. Right? Because it's a, it helps you solve an inverse, it helps you solve a least squares problem, and it helps you solve an underdetermined thing, all in one formula. This is super cool. We have now just done all of linear algebra. It's like in one line there. Yeah? So in particular, it's big, big text, so it's important, right? We can define the pseudo-inverse of A, A plus, to be exactly that thing that we got out of our optimization. So what are some properties of A plus? Well, if A is square and invertible, right, then by our argument, we know that A plus is equal to A inverse. If A is overdetermined, then it gives me a least square solution. And when it's underdetermined, it gives me the least square solution with the minimum norm. Right? The super slick matrix. What's the drawback? Well, once again, I told you at the beginning of this class we should never compute A inverse, and we just did. Right? So secretly, the problem here is that, once again, you should keep in mind that SVD is very expensive. But if you have it, then life is good. Now, we're nowhere near the end of this lecture, but that's okay. We'll, so we'll, we'll continue on it. Okay, so A is U sigma V transpose, our favorite formula. And if you read this formula off row by row, then in fact you can write A in a slightly different way, as just the sum over all these singular values I, of sigma I times UI, that's the i column of the first guy, times VI transpose. Do you guys see why this is? Vaguely what's going on here is that this V matrix, where we split on the side, is transpose. Yeah? The sigmas are all just diagonal, right? So really, you kind of you have an inner product between one u and one sigma each time, and everything else gives you a value. Okay. So this matrix, right, this u v transpose. Uh, this is a matrix. Remember, v transpose u is a dot product. U v transpose. It's called an outer product. This trivia back in the day. And if you think about it. Right? Remember, uh, originally I wrote, uh, so this is the sum over i, sigma i, u, v, transpose i, uh, yeah? So if I want, if this thing is a, and I multiply it by a vector x, that's the same as multiplying this by a vector x, yeah? And now we're going to apply our favorite, you know, trick from, from CS205, we're going to group differently. And this thing is nothing more than a dot product between v, i, and x. So in particular, if I want to get the product A times X, that's nothing more than this sum on the right-hand side. See, there's a dot product, and then you have these UI vectors on the left. So this gives us a nice way to compute A times X, because what can I do? Well, I know that if sigma I is small, it doesn't contribute a heck of a lot to this sum. So maybe I just zero them out. Right? So one way to, to, to find the product AX is just to evaluate the sum, but only use the I's for which sigma I is significantly big. Now this is probably overkill because matrix vector multiplication is a pretty easy operation. But what if I want to find the pseudo inverse of A times X? Well now, right, it's the same expression, right? All the pseudo inverse does is takes those uh, singular values and, 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 and finds their reciprocal. No? Well, so now all the small sigma i's became big, all the big sigma i's became small. So now, I do the same trick, and I ignore the large singular values when I evaluate 
uh, a plus times this matrix x. So if I want an approximation of a inverse times x, one way to do this is to evaluate the sum, but only for the small sigma i's. What this means is that sometimes if I want to compute the SVD, I don't need the whole SVD. I only need the, uh, some set of the smallest singular values. And this is why occasionally the SVD is okay. Right? Do you see what, the, what just happened here? I originally, I wrote down a formula for AX, but then some of the terms here, right, the ones for which this coefficient is really small, can just be ignored. Right? So if the coefficient is really small, right, if you have one over a big number, then we're just going to throw it out of our sum altogether. So this, seems, this tells us that we can compute sort of just a piece of the SVD corresponding to the small singular values and ignore the rest. And for, for this sort of an application, it's okay. Right. And so that's what I was saying. Our trick is we're not even going to compute these singular values at all. And in fact, there's a theorem, and this we most certainly will not prove in this class, which says that, in fact, if I do this, if I take the SVD and I just zero out uh, certain singular values that are close to zero, and I only keep k of them, this is in fact the best possible rank k approximation of my matrix with respect to both the Frobenius norm and with respect to the two norm. It's a very strong theory. Cool. Right, so there are lots of other things we can do with, uh, with our matrix here, uh, with our decomposition rather. One of them, and then I guess we'll stop for today, is to find the Frobenius norm of A. Right. What is that? Well, if you guys will uh, let me indulge in an extra two and a half minutes, then we'll stop. Um, by the way, we need to know here's homework, so you should be intimately familiar with it now, right? You've struggled for hours on this, this thing. So the, the, the Frobenius norm of A squared, well, so it's nothing more than the two norm of each of the columns all summed together, right? One way to think about it. This is a vector now, right? So this is just iterating over to the each of the column and taking two norm squared. Okay, but we know that this, the, that A is now going to be u sigma v transpose e j. Okay, right. So, so what can I, what can I do to this thing? Well, remember that u is orthogonal. So u doesn't affect lengths of things. Okay. Particularly, this is the same. It's sigma v transpose j, right? Which says that this sum, right? This is just the column of this product. Is really just the Frobenius norm of sigma v transpose. That's weird. Yeah, just by the reverse of this step here. Yeah. Well, the norm of the Frobenius norm of matrix is obviously equal to the Frobenius norm of his transpose. Yeah. So this is the same as the norm of V sigma. I should do that. Yeah. And finally, V is also an orthogonal matrix, so he doesn't change lengths of things. And what we're left with is the Frobenius norm of sigma. Yeah. So that means the Frobenius norm of A is nothing more than the sum of the squares of the singular values of A. Yeah? Of course, this expression is harder to compute than the, <laughs> the actual honest-to-goodness Frobenius norm, right? The Frobenius norm is just iterating over the matrix A and squaring all its elements, something like that. But somehow it gives yet another relationship to SVD, and in fact, it, uh, a place where this is better is the two-norm of, uh, of the matrix. Remember, that's nothing more than the biggest eigenvalue of A transpose A. And that, just by definition, is the max singular value. Uh, yeah. And the condition number of A is the ratio of biggest to smallest. Yeah. So nearly everything we can do in linear algebra can be written in terms of different pieces of the SVD. Super nice thing. And so whenever you're asked to do sort of a math proof about linear algebra, when you're asked to write an algorithm, this is not a useful tool necessarily because it's very expensive to compute. But if you're trying to prove something about life, then a good way to go, if you have nothing else better to do, is to just plug in A equals U sigma V transpose, which you can always do. It's not like, for example, Cholesky, you have to be careful about, right? Because you, you get a check that it's symmetric and positive definite. But this one always exists. And oftentimes, solutions to basic linear algebra problems will pop right up. Cool? So next time, uh, we'll, we'll show a couple sort of practical computer graphics applications of this and, and computer vision. 
uh, statistics and so on. For example, if I have two point clouds and I want to align them, this happens a lot, like I have a 3D scanner and I have different poses of a shape, then maybe I'd like to put them all in the same coordinate space so that I can reconstruct the shape. Uh, it turns out the answer that the state-of-the-art way to do this is basically using the SVD. And an easy application of that is for def deforming 3D meshes and shapes, like uh, there's this tool, I, I put a YouTube link you can watch at home, uh, and they show how you can take this cactus and pull on points and have him deform in a nice way. And we'll also uh, return to the statistics example that we started with at the beginning of uh, two lectures ago. But anyway, we're out of time now. So if somebody could uh, hit the camera, we'll call it a day. And I'll see you on Monday. Your homework is due then. And uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs>